Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Majesta Simpkins School for Human Rights. Today, of course, is June 14th, 2021. We are about five days away, of course, from celebrating Juneteenth, which marks the end of uh, slavery in the United States, uh, in Galveston, Texas, in 1865. We're also about a month away from celebrating Bastille Day in France, which was a momentous occasion in the French Revolution as well. So, of course, as we all know, the summertime is uh, appropriate time for revolution, unless you're in South Carolina where it's too hot to do anything. But anyways, uh, welcome back to the Majesta School. Uh, and this evening's class is a bit different from the other ones we've had so far this semester. Most of them have focused on some form uh, or aspect of history, but tonight really digs into the nuts and bolts of organizing and the actual tactics and strategy behind being a successful organizer and being a successful activist. And many of us, virtually all of us, are in some form or fashion interested in the intricacies of activism and protest. So we're gonna be discussing that this evening. And as is the case with all of our classes, we really wanna encourage folks to ask questions, to interact with us, to really talk about their own uh, perceptions and their own ideas behind activism and organizing, because this is the kind of session that really works best with participation from folks in the class. So again, thanks so much for uh, coming back to us this lovely Monday evening. Uh, and I'll turn the floor over. It'll be actually a shared operation myself and Brett. So uh, Brett, uh, having that there. Thank you, Dr. Green. And you forgot the important date coming up on July 3rd when these people graduate. And we are going to do it in an in-person, face-to-face graduation with all of you that have your vaccination number tattooed somewhere. And that uh, we're going to do it, depending on the weather, in the backyard at Majeska's house or an alternative air-conditioned location where the walking distance. And um, y'all come. And if you haven't been vaccinated, you can come and you can stand over in the parking lot adjacent to us and wave and explain why you haven't been vaccinated. But I did want to recognize that it's not just me and Robert tonight. Uh, we have uh, the co-chairs of the organization. This is the, the Education Fund, which is our nonpartisan educational foundation element, policy work. And that's, um, uh, it says Kalina Hammock. We're going to fix that. That's her daughter. And it's apparently her daughter's computer is smarter than Marjorie's computer. You see her nodding. And uh, Mar Marjorie Hammock is one of our co-chairs and has a tremendous amount of experience uh, raising hell, making people uh, do the right thing. And she's going to share some of her thoughts with us, I'm quite sure. And Kyle Kriminger, who's been with us, sat in the corner for the first year or two. And when he opened his mouth, he got himself elected as co-chair because he's really smart and pays attention. And so uh, I'm really excited to have both of them as, as the people that can actually fire me and back. And I'm looking forward to a bloodless coup. And uh, Daniel Deweese is with us, who's been, uh, uh, he's been taken on, he quit his day job, and he's working with us for sub-minimum wages, uh, helping us do administration as he is learning the ropes. And um, yay, Daniel. And Omar may be with us. But what I wanted to do, um, Robert, is let you start off talking about what it is in the, in the slideshow. Are you, are we going to use the slideshow now? Sure. Yes. And using that just as kind of as a talking point thing, not keeping it up and blocking all the pretty people. And they need to know that they can go to the view up at the top right hand side of their thing and keep gallery views so they don't just see the person that's talking and they can actually see some human beings while this is happening. But uh, Robert is going to use the, the study guide uh, the, or the that we have a slideshow that matches the study guide, which all of you, if you haven't finished, finish it. A lot of good links and resources there because one of the things that you need to know as an organizer is the things you don't know and how to find them because there's a whole lot you can't keep in your head but being able to have places that you can go to find things is really good and we'll be dealing with that uh, after the graduation with skills and tools classes that we're going to do and we'll, we'll talk about that at, at a latter class at the practicum class and sign people up for specific things. So we actually are putting on classes in an order that they're asked for, for the different skills and tools that we need to know how to make change. And so Robert, pull up, pull up your slideshow and, and um, minimize that if you can, so we can have as few people blocked on the, I guess that's about it. <clears throat> All right. 
Um, so basically what we're doing this evening is really delving into the idea of what it means to be an actual organizer. Uh, and, you know, normally I would do like a, a full screen slideshow, but I kind of want to make sure folks can, can see each other as we're going through this as well. But some of this might be familiar to you guys. Some of it may not be, but all of it will be very useful information, both here and going down the road with your activism and your organizing. So I guess the first thing that we should really discuss this evening is what is the actual point? of community organizing. I know this community organizing is a term that is thrown, out, thrown about a lot. I know obviously with um, Barack Obama's campaign in 2008, it was thrown around a lot as sort of an epithet. It's like, oh, he's a community organizer. What does that mean? Um, but community organizing is something that actually means something. It has some concrete real world value. And as you can see here from the slide, uh, community organizing can mean several things all at once. Number one, it's about building enough power to improve people's lives. Of course, we are all here at the Majestic School, whether we're going to become activists or just concerned engaged citizens, whichever way you want to go about doing it, community organizing is all about building power to improve the lives of others. It's not about enriching ourselves. It's not about making ourselves powerful on our own just for the sake of power. It is about actually trying to improve people's lives. Also, this community organizing recognizes that the power is inherent in the community itself, not the organizer or the organization. In other words, um, what we're really talking about here is that you're trying to empower the community to make decisions for itself, to obtain power for itself, to improve itself, its surrounding social. Above all, go ahead, Brett. Robert, I just want to add a couple of things here that one of the things that I've kind of figured out over the years is that there's an assumption, especially on the part of liberals, that power is just as bad. Power is the enemy. Well, uh, it may not be what we would like to see in the perfect world, but there will be no perfect world if we yield power. And the power to implement your values is really important if your values have to do with sustaining the planet and the people that live on it in a, in a civilized and humane fashion. And so that kind of leads me to this question that we're going to pose to you. And you don't have to ask right now, but you will be asked this question. Are you a revolutionary? And that I believe, and this is part of what I learned from Majeska, and we're going to make this part of the Majeska School, is that a revolution has the commitment to the values that a liberal doesn't. A liberal doesn't have a commitment to the, to, to the uncomfortable work to be a revolutionary that swims against the tide. And we're principled, we do know that we need to make concessions to win things, but there's a difference between looking for systemic change and working to make the system work nicer. And there's wonderful old sayings that come out of the, the industrial workers of the world. They were clever, clever organizers back 100 years ago. You can trust the liberal to grease your knife they use to cut your throat. Another one is you can trust that the merchant to sell you the rope you use to hang them. And so there, there's always going to be conflicts, and there are healthy conflicts, between people that want to make the system nicer and people that want to change the system. And what I have some problems with, because I explain to my friends that are liberal that just want to change things, is that's really good. Because what I do gives you running room. And so the radical faction gives the liberal faction more opportunity to make progressive change that perhaps gives us all more running room. And um, that's what I had to say about that, Robert. No, and I think that's actually a really important point here because it does bring us to the next point in the slide, which is that if you are organizing in a community, then one of the things that you have to do is help people connect the dots to understand the root problems of, of, of social problems, the root causes of social problems, rather than just simply the symptoms, right? And understand who benefits from all this. And, and I mention this right now because the, the crux of the Majesta School, the reason you've learned so much history in the last few months, is not just for the sake of knowing it, although that's that's important in itself, but the intrinsic value here is also understanding the root cause of so many problems in South Carolina. And as you've seen over the last few months, so many of these problems are rooted in the history of South Carolina. First, at the colony, and then there's a state of the United States. 
And you know you're onto something when everybody starts trying to stop what you're doing. We'll talk later in this program this evening about the critical race theory. But I want to point out that at the beginning of, of time, the history that you learn in the Majeska School and studying the history of time in any history class is what these people don't want you to remember. And so we have we go back to that fork in the road between W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. They all remember, and the Booker T. folks wanted to make, make things nicer, and the W.E.B. Du Bois folks wanted to change the reason they weren't nice to begin with. That's dynamic still exists, friends. Move on. Indeed. Um, and, you know, again, with community organizing, we've been talking a lot about power and how to actually build up power and how to build up communities to organize for themselves. So there are a few other key points to remember with all of that. Number one, you have to know that your, your most important job is to teach someone else how to do their job. In other words, you're trying to empower individuals uh, in the community to also take up the mantle of leadership. You know, uh, folks like uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker and others, they modeled ideas for leadership. And Ella Baker, most notably, often talked about how to create organizations without actual leaders per se, that everyone should see themselves as a leader onto themselves, that you don't want to depend too much on charismatic leadership to get the job done. You want to have also a strategic approach to problems that yield a win or a victory of some sort, regardless of the results. In other words, you want to make sure, and we're going to talk about this this evening, this, this idea of strategy and then tactics. You want to have long-term goal that you're building up to, trying to get wins, and you're looking forward to those long-term goals with those victories in mind. Think about what we've covered this semester in terms of civil rights and human rights activism in South Carolina, for example. Uh, some of the things that folks like Modesta Simpkins and many others were pushing for were wins on the way towards a larger struggle, struggle with shared vision for social justice and for human rights. And, well, Rob, uh, yes. Robert, let me point out a kind of a in hand on the ground South Carolina example of like a strategic approach. And the the question of what it is that you can practically move to organize around. Now, in, in 2013, the Affordable Care Act passed, and one of the missions of that was to give people health care. Now, it's really interesting that that, because of the fact that we are a capital supremacist society instead of a social supremacist society, that that was not any kind of universal health care. It was an insurance program where we took your money and paid insurance companies to keep taking money from you in case you got sick. It, it, it would have been about half the cost of America if we just expanded Medicare for all. We can't do that now because the corporations are in charge and they run the politicians and the policies. And so the Affordable Care Act had a component in it to provide health care to the people that couldn't afford insurance, even under this subsidized system, which was below the poverty level. And so the unique thing about this uh, federal policy, you know that the South Carolina Progressive Network is state-centric, that we can't change D.C. till we change S.C. I can't go out and knock on doors and tell people to support universal health care for Bernie Sanders when, <laughs> when I know that my, my congressional representative, Joe, Joe Wilson, even if Bernie became president, this is the 2016 presidential preference primary, uh, even if Bernie became president, Joe Wilson's not going to vote for it. You're not going to get it passed. So what the tactic on the ground, driven by the strategy to win something that could actually improve people's lives was, was to work on Medicaid expansion. Because it's something that the governor of South Carolina could, could take the federal money. We not, don't have to wait on Joe Wilson to do it. A billion point four the first year. And so in 2016, the Progressive Network is doing nonpartisan work about not, we could identify people that didn't have health insurance that were going to fall through the crack. They weren't going to get anything because they were below the poverty level and they weren't going to get a free Medicaid card. And so we're knocking on doors in these communities we've targeted, telling people that the choice is, here it is, you can choose someone that supports you getting health care and somebody that doesn't. Right here in South Carolina, you vote to make a difference. And that was real. 
their vote could actually make that difference if they elected a governor that wanted to give them health care. On the other side of the street, we find out that our revolution is knocking on doors telling people to, to vote for universal health care, Medicare for all, which isn't on the South Carolina ballot, which isn't, it's, it's, it's visionary, it's what we need, it's what we know is a goal, but it wasn't strategic smart, strategically smart. And so that's an, an example that's in hand where an on-the-ground game being run literally in the same neighborhoods with, with a different strategic approach. Yeah, and, and again, this is this is also get, actually getting to our next point. I think this actually is what Brett was just talking about with how these on the ground campaigns work, uh, which is that with community organizing, the most effective community organizers are folks who are who live and organize around their own vision and values. In other words, that one way you want to think about this is that community organizers should be folks who understand the places in which they're organizing. Right. So, for example, you think about how grassroots organizations are so important to many of these debates and topics, partly because they are filled with men and women who are from those communities who understand what those communities need and are looking for and can help organize around a shared set of values. Must, however, be absolutely clear about motives, both personal and then the motives for the collective of the entire community. So that way, there is a sense of transparency, a sense of understanding about what everyone's looking for. Again, this is not the kind of thing you want to get into if you're trying to amass a lot of money and power and prestige. Just hard work. This is difficult work, but it's also necessary work. At least my next point, you have to be authentic and comfortable with your message when it comes to community organizing. Folks, and I think everyone in this classroom has, has experience with this. When you meet someone who is clearly not really engaged with a topic or with an issue, it makes a big difference. Whereas if someone actually knows what they're talking about, knows what they're organizing about, that can mean all the world. And then also knowing the issues better than your opponents, right? This is another big part of community organizing. It's one of the reasons, and it's the primary reason why when setting up this class, Brett and I made sure to also feature documents and primary sources from folks who are holding levers of power, the, the, the Strom Thurmonds, the John C. Calhouns, the Ben Tillmans, et cetera, because you want to get in the habit of understanding what the issues are from all angles, not just from what you support, but from potential uh, points of opposition and the like that could be brought up by opponents of your organizing efforts. So, Robert, I wanted to um, lift up a couple of points here. Was that the, this? We're talking about motive, and one of the things that that I'm having trouble with for most of my life is running into people that would disparage a motive if the values are the same. I had I went through a period of after spending time in prison of trying to figure out, well, why am I here on the planet? You know, what can I do with my life that's productive? And, um, and so I, I would say that I came to my full-time commitment on the, making the planet a better place to be. I'm going to use my time here to do that. And so that's kind of a spiritual perspective. And that um, I would have people that, I'm also a Marxist, so I have a political perspective. But those two things can, you know, merge together for me, but there are people that come to wanting to do good work for different motives, and we need to recognize that. And that one of the things that I think is a shortcoming in the, in, in the left is seeding the moral high ground. Somehow, we now have uh, what the largest denomination in South Carolina is having a meeting this week in, in Nashville to come out against the critical race theory to come down on homosexuality and et cetera. The Southern Baptist Convention is having the same kind of turmoil that much of America and the world actually is having, you know, spinning off on this new, you know, new nativism is a nice way to, to refer to the racist stuff that's happening post-Trump or pre-Trump, during Trump. And that, um, so the, the Southern Baptist Coalition, in my estimation, is not living the values that I think that Jesus did. He was a revolutionary. The guy got in trouble. He got nailed to a cross. And um, 
he was he was a, a brown Palestinian with you know curly hair, and the powers that be took him out. But so the, there's just this disconnect between people that are you know dialectical materialist or Marxist, and people that come to uh, an approach of radical change through some type of spiritual perspective that believes that it's my job here on the planet to try and see that this experiment, this wonderful experiment of humanity uh, here on this little orb continues beyond that. And so I just want to make that point that we need to be expressive. We also need to, to, to worm our way in. If you're, in if, you're, if you're a churched person, uh, work you know, in your congregation. If you're not, talk to your friends and neighbors that are. And I think that we can do a lot of the classes that we're doing uh, in churches, as well as other civic organizations. Robert, that's it. Yeah, and, and I would add to your point there that one of the things that has come up time and again in our class, in the Justice School, is we're talking about human rights campaigns. Many of those involve people who were not only on the left, but were also religiously inclined. I mean, you think about many of the abolitionists, uh, you think about the 20th century, there are many folks on the left who found ways to reconcile their, their left-wing beliefs with a, a firm belief in Christianity as well. Martin Luther King Jr. being a notable example of that and so forth. And so we can draw folks from a variety of backgrounds uh, with variety of motives into community organizing um, for the sake of shared goals. I think again, as we're seeing in the chat, there's some really illuminating conversation about how we do some of this in the South, especially. Now, speaking of goals, right? This evening, we're talking about goals, strategy, and tactics. And <coughs> let's first briefly address goals. And Brett's already kind of talked a bit about this, but goals, not surprisingly, are our desired results. And here's an example. To reach our goals of universal health care and free quality education, our strategy is to promote the value in public ownership, otherwise known as economic democracy and taxation. Um, things that seem radical in the United States, but are commonplace in the rest of the civilized world. Now, our goal here is a radical revolution of social values that addresses the root cause of our states and nations problems. And I would just add my own personal commentary to this that if you think about what's happened in the last year with the COVID-19 pandemic and with the resurgence of Black Lives Matter and the like, in the last year, I think many Americans have asked some serious, thoughtful questions about the kind of country we actually live in. And one would hope that it has pushed more Americans to begin to think about the goals that our nation should have in terms of what kind of nation it actually wants to be. It's very difficult to keep maintaining the idea the United States is the wealthiest, most powerful nation on earth, which in some metrics it is, while on the other hand, during the last year or so, we've had tremendous difficulties with healthcare, with public health, uh, with uh, logistic chains for a wide range of products and services, and so forth. We actually live in a very fragile country, if you think about it. And so our goals of, of radical revolutionary change I think are goals that are laudable, worthy, and goals that, again, we are working towards as community organizers. But the question becomes, well, oh, Freddie, right, you have some answer there? Um, in a minute, Robert, go ahead. But the question becomes, well, how do we actually reach those goals? And I know this seems like a, a pretty um, self-explanatory discussion this evening, but it, it's worth talking about these goals uh, in a larger context, right? Let so how do you... Let me share my screen on that point, Robert. I'm going to stop you and start me. And this is, a, is an example of reaching a goal. And that the goal is a just and humane society. Pretty, pretty big reach. One of the goals is being able to have a government that supports your goals, a just and humane government, a really big reach. So how can you scale down your strategy to reach your goals? So one of the biggest problems in, in America, well, in much of the world, but definitely we, we, we master it, is letting the capital supremacist dictate our public policies where capital is more important than the, the human capital. 
And uh, if you've been paying attention, you know that Dr. King talked about the revolution, the radical revolution of values. And that's that difference between thinking that stuff's more important than people. A simple concept made very difficult by the way we've been running. They've, somebody's been running this country since before it was founded, predicated on acquisition. Money contributes to power. Money and power contribute to policy, making policy. And so the biggest problem we have right now is that government is the enemy. Now, how did that happen? How did that happen? I mean, it goes back, I mean, it goes all the way back, at least that I'm most versed with, and Robert can chime in, when Roosevelt tried to, to pass, uh, Roosevelt passed um, the Social Security in 1935. And it was a big lift, and it followed, you know, the uh, Depression and the, the World War I vets not getting their benefits and whatnot. So there was a lot of turmoil in the country. Roosevelt grabbed the thing by the neck, had a majority in both houses, and jammed stuff through. We haven't had a president do that in a long time. And that the, then in the 1970s, uh, there was this guy came along, a great star, movie, great star movie actor from California named Ronald Reagan. Um, and he taught everybody that government's not the solution, it's the problem. And that Grover Norquist, one of his great brain trusts, has a theory that he's beat on to the point that any you know, real conservative people can quote it. We must shrink government to the size that can be drowned in a bathtub. And if you, you can look at various places in the world, various countries in the world, that have a more just and humane government, and what you have is people that, that live there trust their government more, with good reason. They get something out of it. And that if you look at the, the COVID rates, uh, life, life expectancy rates, health care rates, et cetera, and those countries where people trust their government, they're all better. Out of the 36 nations that are supposed to be in the first world club, we're, we're like num number 35 in terms of providing stuff. Uh, and the only one that has less uh, money than we do is Mexico in terms of taxes. Our taxes are lower than anywhere else. Wow, maybe there's a correlation between having really, really low taxes and people not trusting giving the government money because they don't get anything from it. Then think about it. In South Carolina, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We are not going to tax anybody because taxes is bad and government's bad, so they don't tax anybody. So there's no money for schools, there's no money for infrastructure, there's no money for health care. And so people blame the government. So they don't fund the government. So the lack of taxes is a self-fulfilling prophecy that the government's no, no good. And so we've got some of the lowest taxes in the civilized world, plus the least benefits. So turning that equation around is tremendously difficult. And so in 2010, the, the Republicans did this tax realignment commission study to find out where's the tax money coming from. And they found where some money was coming from and leaving literally more money on the table in taxes than they took up, uh, meaning that there were uh, sales taxes weren't collected, service taxes weren't collected, there were exemptions to all kinds of taxes. All these things have been built in over decades and nobody even knew where they came from. Reducing our tax level, reducing our tax level. And so this, they found like three, three or four billion dollars. Their, their solution to this was to reduce taxes even further. Oh boy, we found all this extra money. We can reduce taxes by, you know, by doing away with these exemptions. And those of us that were more civilly oriented said, no, you should use this extra money to fund your obligations. You're morally obligated and statutorily obligated by, by statute to put 4% of your general budget back to local governments that you're not doing and to have a per pupil funding that you're not doing. And so those, those are things that, that, that we fought about on the moral budget and we showed the mob the lobby thing. And so what we did was we argued against specific exemptions to help under, people understand that, well, we do have the money but we're giving these exemptions to people that buy a Mercedes Benz that costs $200,000 for the like, luxury model, but their taxes are the same as somebody that buys a used Chevy. And so when you put it in that real kind of bite-sized ability, people understand it better. 
you saw Joe Neal, if you were in that last class, saying that when we had mopped the lobby, the speaker wanted to know what the hell do you people want? What people? Here they are. We need to put a face on it with specific demands that they could answer. And we got like $380 million increased in that budget. That's the type of thing that a progressive movement needs to be doing all the damn time. And we don't have the capacity, the money, the resources, the troops to do it. And so hopefully we'll be growing troops out of this class and the last classes and we need your help. And so that's an example of taking a bite of something to make us to, to begin working on a really significant problem. And Robert, I'm, I hope I'm still on target there. You move oh, on to your next Very time. much so. Uh, as a matter of fact, and, and please indulge my um, my brief segue for a second here, but you, your, your point about a moral budget uh, reminded me of a, uh, a famous Robert F. Kennedy speech from 1968 about GDP. Um, when, and I'll just read a couple of, of sections from it very briefly, and we'll get back to the PowerPoint. But I, I want to read this because I, I think part of what we're getting at this evening in terms of of community organizing and revolution of values is in, in some ways, we're not even asking for a revolution of values so much as we're asking for a return to values from a previous era of American history. So I just wanna read, this is from Robert Kennedy's speech, 1968, uh, directly quoting him here, quote, too much and for too long, we seem to have surrendered to personal excellence and community values, values in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product now, this is 1968, is over $800 billion a year. But that gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that, that gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear out highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwood and the loss of our natural wonder and chaotic sprawl. It counts napalm and counts nuclear warheads and armored cars for the police to fight the riots in our cities. It counts Whitman's rifle and Speck's knife and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And it can tell us everything about America, except why we are proud that we are Americans." Hmm. Uh, so I, I always kind of go back to that speech. I mean, I know we mentioned the difference between liberals and, and, and revolutionaries, but even, even pushing people to get back to that way of thinking about things like gross national product and the like would be revolution values in some fashion. But again, like Brett mentioned, that that's the 60s and then the 70s and 80s. You have Ronald Reagan. And well, the, the taxes during Eisenhower's time on rich people were in the 90s. Eisenhower warned us against the military industrial complex. And so, yes, there, there, there's been kind of a thread of, of civility running through American patriots forever, but they don't, they haven't been able to hold force against what these economic forces are, which have been the military industrial complex. But now the, the richest countries in the world don't make anything. They, they provide IT or they sell things that other people make. But um, I want to quote another politician with another statement that is a really good statement, but I we want to see it applied. Show me your budget and I'll show you your values. That's mm -hmm. Joe Biden. And so this is this is it's a real deal, folks. If you don't put your money in it, you don't get the money, you know, you don't get it out. I mean, we have arguments, obviously, that we can show a direct relationship but uh, racial, racial discrimination. And you can show all kind of other discrimination, but this one's easier because we can we can categorize it, we can de de demographically identify it. Where you've got zip codes, the majority black, the lifespan, the health, the health conditions. They also have funding by education predicated on their address, and so we've got everything kind of predicated on money. Can you have an equitable democracy under a free market? laissez-faire capitalism. That's a question, I'll, you know, we'll talk about. Robert, do you want to wait and take questions when we get through with the PowerPoint and open the thing up so people can debate that? But I want you to, t to challenge me. Are you a revolutionary? 
can you have a civil society? Can we even protect a planet to being here in a while if we let uh, capital supremacy rule the game? That's enough of my preaching. Robert, move along. Okay, so I'll, I'll get back to the uh, the PowerPoint. And again, some of these points are, are almost self-explanatory, but they're still worth talking about here. One of them is, of course, the idea of what it means when we're talking about strategy. A strategy is a plan of action designed to achieve one of those goals we mentioned earlier. And it's developed before the fight begins. It, it can be advanced even if you lose an individual battle. Um, the thing about strategy, of course, is that relating to goals for a second, you want to have both long-term goals and long-term strategies. In other words, you want to be able to absorb the possibility, in fact, I would say the inevitability of setback from time to time. Um, and so with strategy, you have to be able to take advantage of opportunities as they arise. Uh, and thinking historically, any social movements in the United States, they had strategies um, embodied by a number of different organizations, but they may have pursued tactics in different ways. So again, you want to have a long-term vision of what you want to achieve on the one hand, and the other, you want to have a long-term vision for how to achieve it. That does include the fact that something may go wrong. Now, with strategy in mind, you do also want to take, um, you also want to take this quotation in mind from a, a strategist and tactician, the boxing ring, Mike Tyson, who once said, Every, um, you know, everyone has a plan, so they're punched in the face. So with that being said, we should talk about strategy and also tactics, because again, all of this is really important to how we understand community organizing and community activism. Robert, I want to share something here for a minute. Um, one of the things that, that we've been doing that y'all need to know about is... Um, having really clever plans that we have that we can't really follow through on. Now, y'all have heard us talking about this as a racial profiling project, but you see, it didn't start out with racial profiling. It started out with a root cause. It started out when we founded the network because we came to building the network with an understanding that racism is basically the original sin in South Carolina and in America and letting that actually drive the economy. And at some point, we may have to add another class about how capitalism in America developed in Charleston, South Carolina in the 1700s. But um, understanding that racism is like really woven in deeply, how are you going to take a bite out of that? So we did this, this study. I did this study with Joe Neal. He, this is, the first one was in 2000, looking at how can we take racism in South Carolina and put it into a shape that we can cut a piece off that we can actually organize around and not just be kind of visionary idealistic. And so we looked at the criminal justice statistics because that was sub, you know, something you could measure. And in doing that, we found out that South Carolina black people, especially young males, are the most likely to be arrested of anywhere we could find on the planet. It's, it's really remarkable. And that so we did your basic organizing where we had, we, we knew the answer, but we wanted to do a community engagement. And so we looked at, we did surveys. This book here, if you haven't read it, is online. And it walks you through a way that you can use this anywhere you are in South Carolina. But that we did a study, uh, when, and you can do this anywhere, uh, to a, a college class, it was an honors class at Benedict, and asked people if they felt they'd been stopped you know, without reason. And the exact 63% of them told the horror stories. We did town hall meetings on is driving while black a problem? Is racial profiling a problem in South Carolina? We knew it was, but we got these anecdotal things became real testimony from people coming in and standing room only hearings in Charleston and Columbia. And then we wrote legislation and then it passed. And then we now have a database that you can use in your hometown to actually see racial disparities on the ground in your hometown. And so that, that's that kind of incremental way of dealing with something that is too big to be able to deal with in a confronted fashion. So you take a piece of it that explains it and also touches people where they live. So it's not abstract. And so I would just suggest that this is something, this is a type of project that you want to consider that's a valuable way to arrange your organizing. 
but also to look at that that study and see if it's something you can do in your hometown. And when we get to the practicum portion of the last session before graduation, we can find people that want to work on that and have another class for them. Robert? Yeah, exactly. And again, you know, that's, that's a reminder of how so much of the work we're talking about with community organizing is actually about the communities in which we live, that it's, it's very much a locally based idea. And if you can offer folks actual concrete things that says, hey, this is what's going on in our communities that can make a big difference. I really advise everyone to take a look at that booklet as soon as you get a chance, because the information there is eye opening. Um, now, that actually is a good segue to thinking a bit about going from strategy to actually talking about tactics just for a brief moment. Um, tactics, of course, are the actions we take to reach our goal. Um, and they are situational. So they're based a bit by circumstances and guided by our principles. So again, the creation of that booklet, I would argue, is actually a, a, a version of, of using tactics to kind of get certain things across to say, we're going to assemble information in this fashion that's very accessible, easy to read, but also answers a need for our community. Um, of course, with tactics, you don't want to get too far ahead of your base or too far behind your vanguard. In other words, you want to have a happy medium where tactics make the most sense, depending on what you're dealing with and what situations do arise. Again, flexibility here is really key to being a community organizer. I think if Bruce Lee were in the classroom, he would remind us to be formless like water. So um, I wanted to give a couple examples. Um, I've got a slide, but it's, I just can articulate it pretty well. Of, of getting ahead of your base and that there's a really good explanation uh, in a short term is revolutionaries are the locomotive force of history. That was a quote from a, a famous revolutionary who will remain nameless. But the, the, the image in your head is the locomotive going faster than the train. And the locomotive gets out there by itself and you get killed because you've left your base behind you. What if the locomotive is holding up the train? And so you can be, and you need to be, uh, the locomotive force of history in challenging the complications in life, providing examples, providing uh, guidance and analysis and supporting people. But you can't outstre outstretch your base. And uh, that's really hard. That's a hard thing to like throttle it down when you know all the answers. And there's another term that came uh, up to mind when you're talking about this, is that those that that feel the need just to raise hell and beat their chest are practicing left-wing infantile disorder where what you're doing makes you feel good but it really doesn't change anything and so unless your protest is tied to some kind of strategic goal that would in all probability need to be a collective thing that's where the or the community organization like the progressive network comes in that you have a strategy that's shared that has a longer term goal and that you, you you work within those parameters in any way that you can make them work. Um, the uh, another simple example is that Move On. I haven't seen Move On in South Carolina for a while, but there was this group called Move On that came up after Bill Clinton, and they were doing good work in places where there was no work being done. But what would happen? And one really clear example was uh, on an issue that we'd been working for a long time in the state house. We had a rally, like a, a, you know, at one part of the place at the state house, and found out that Move On was doing something, like on a block away. But they all they did was send out an email and ask who wants to lead this show, and so it's kind of like drive-by organizing, where they get somebody to buy. Oh, I'll do that, but they're not plugged into anything. They're not plugged into any kind of long-term strategy. They don't know what's happening on the ground. They don't know who the decision makers are. They don't you know connect the dots, and so there's there's, there's different variances that we'll encounter with people that are organizing based on perhaps a national model that isn't particularly designed for South Carolina. Uh, the work that's been going on around the, the election fraud, the, the states that are getting all the attention, uh, like the, the, the one in Georgia, all, all of those states have Republican secretaries of state that are running the elections. We don't. All of those states have things that can get you thrown off the, the voter registration list. We don't. You register for a license in South Carolina. And so people react 
that uh, in a way that's not predicated to where their feet touch the ground, which is what Dr. Green just told us. Thank you, Robert. And I, you know, I, I'm actually glad you mentioned that too, because it reminds me of a term that uh, Fred Hampton coined back in 1969, shortly before his assassination, he, he referred to what he called customism, uh, where he was very critical. And I'll put it in the chat. It, it's, if you see the actual ner term, you may know where it comes from, custerism, um, based off of George Armstrong Custer. And his argument was there were some revolutionaries in the left in the late 60s who were more determined to make noise than to actually make change. And so he was, he was actually quite critical of some folks in the late 60s in Chicago and elsewhere who he said were doing nothing more than pursuing custerism by not really having an actual goals in mind or even any actual strategy, they were just tearing things up. And to happen to others, they were saying, well, that's that's not good enough. You have to have an actual idea behind your tactics, your strategy, and some actual goals uh, to push for. And this actually brings us to another important point. Since we do not yet have the power to win our most important fight, it take time, we build power by rewarding our allies and punishing our enemies. Right. So you do want to, want to keep that in mind. Um, but also remember that, especially working with progressive revolutionary movements in South Carolina and across the South and across the country, uh, we really can't outspend our opponents. We must outthink them. And I think we all in recent years have come to see how this has played out time and time again, that one side in, in the current struggle for American freedom, American democracy, has a lot more money and resources than the other side. So we have to really outthink them in terms of tactics and, and the like. And actually with that, Brett, did you want to tell your story about one particular instance of, of using very little money to make something of great change? I'm sorry, Robert, I, I couldn't quite hear what you're saying. I want to see your face. I'm stopping your, your screen oh, okay. share. So what I was saying was- um, Stop your screen share. The point about not outspending but outthinking opponents. Um, did you want to tell a particular story about an instance of that where you had very little in the way of resources but achieved a lot in the process? Well, I, I know that we have several. If you have one in mind, prompt me. Um, the one about the you mentioned so you, to me a story this weekend about using uh, I forgot the exact name of them, but these bucks to bring attention to a legislator in South Carolina. Oh, uh, Bobby Box. Yeah. Yes, yes. So that was a good way to kind of talk about tactics and, and skills at the same time. Yeah, so I actually have that and can't oh, actually share that if we share my screen, because this is a really good one. And uh, we're gonna continue to stop your sharing. And I'm gonna do this, and we're gonna do this. And so this is, <laughs> this was a low cost, high return operation. And one of the things that you will learn after tilting at windmills for a long time and getting really tired to try and organize the cats to do something um, is that never let it be said that a small number of people can't change things because they're the only ones that ever have. That was Margaret Mead. And then Grace Slick and the Jefferson Starship said, people with a clever plan can assume the role of the mighty. So we'd been working on money and politics since we started the Progressive Network. One of the first things we did was to um, copy uh, an entire election cycle of, of campaign finance at the Ethics Commission, because South Carolina was the last state in the nation that had it online. And they said they couldn't afford it. And we'd introduce bills and they said they can't afford it. So we got a $10,000 grant, copied everything, sent it off, got it, put it up on the web, embarrassed them, and then they started that. But we've been fighting to reduce the influence of money in politics since we began fighting. And so this guy here, Bobby Harrell, was the Speaker of the House, arguably one of the most important people in the state of South Carolina. And so the, the campaign finance law says that Bobby Harrell can't take more than $1,000. No House member could take more than $1,000. A statewide candidate can take no more than 3500 And so the Herald started a leadership pack called the Palmetto Leadership Council. So it was this kind of hybrid thing. It wasn't his for him, it was for leadership. But that what they were doing is bundling money 
And bundling is when you take up campaign money and you put it in a pot and then you can distribute it differently. And so it, it, Bobby Harrell had a fundraiser for his leadership pack and the admission to the fundraiser was $3,500 in the Summit Club right there across the street from the State House. And John Krangle and myself and a few other of our cadre, maybe 10 or 12 of us, we printed these Bobby bucks and they had this explanation on the back of them as to what Bobby was going to do with the money. And we stationed ourselves around all the entrances to the Summit Club, passing them out to people going in and saying, get your Bobby bucks, buy yourself some you know, political influence, $3,500 right here. And uh, what Bobby did was he then put the money in the bank and he could then give the money. He gave his largest donation, according to this thing here, which we can make available for you later, was $100,000 to the Republican Party. And see, the Republican Party can give a statewide candidate 50000 Bobby can't. No, no individual can give the, uh, you know, the, uh, a candidate more than $3,500 if they run for governor or one of the statewide offices. But if an individual candidate has a leadership pack and takes up all this money and then gives it to the party, the party can then give the money. And the, and the party can also give Bobby Harrell and his other house friends $5,000 because the party can give more money than you can thereby neatly navigating a way around campaign finance laws. And we did this, and Renee Dudley, who was a reporter for the Post and Courier, was there, and she got a hold of this, and she didn't turn loose of it. She got Bobby Harrell's records on using his airplane and getting money for flying to Columbia from Charleston, and they, they, he was also charging his hangar fees and his gasoline fees and his fees for going to football games with people. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on who you were, Bobby had to leave. And Bobby stepped away from the legislature. And the end of Palmetto leadership, of it, leadership councils were terminated at that point. And so that was an effort that, that took something we'd been working on for years, found a niche opportunity, played it well, and it rang a bell. And so, Robert, that's, I think, my story that you want me to tell that I yeah, have so yeah. many stories, Robert. You know how it is. <laughs> that, that was definitely one because I think it's, it's a wonderful embodiment of, of how you have uh, tactics and goals and strategy all rolled into one, right? You're doing a lot with very little money, uh, but you took advantage of an opportunity mm -hmm. and you took it and ran with it. And um, nobody got arrested. Yeah, and well, that's, that's, that's a plus. Uh, so, that, so again, you know, I want I want everybody to think about when we get to talking about the actual practicum part of the course, and thinking about well, how do we actually translate what we learn to actual organizing? Then you want to get creative with it. You don't. You you want to make sure that you're 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 trying every possible opportunity, and with the skills that you're developing as a community organizer, you have to remember that you're both teachers and students. In other words, you're teaching folks, you're trying to help them learn things, but you're also learning from those people as well. Never assume you cannot learn from someone in your community as you're doing community organizing. That's the absolute last thing you want to think. Instead, you should think of every conversation, every, every opportunity you have to organize as a moment and a chance to learn something new, learn something important not only about the community that you're organizing, but also about the, the goals and the strategies that you want to pursue as a community organizer. Oh, go ahead. Robert, I have a, something that I wanted to share that um, exemplifies uh, a, kind of a skill and tool level, but also uh, shows um, the way money controls public policy. And this is, I have, and we don't have time for it, folks. Buy me a beer some night and I'll talk for a long time. But the way that, that money so clearly determines state policy is something that has driven me up a wall for a long time. When the COVID thing happened, I, I was apparently the only one that really understood who was driving the train. And Governor McMaster created this thing called the Accelerate SC Task Force in the beginning to be able to draw a plan to get South Carolina through this thing and come out strong and business friendly. Well, that plan was actually drawn by the hospitality, Palmetto Hospitality Association. The Palmetto Hospitality Association is a consortium of, of uh, hospitality groups. They have hotels, they have bars, they have restaurants. 
there are two NRAs in America, the National Rifle Association, their, their, their sun is setting. They're having a hard time now. But the other NRA that's just about as powerful is the National Restaurant Association, which the Palmetto Hospitality Association is a part of. And so the group that Governor McMaster used to write his budget for COVID that he appointed to the Accelerate SC Task Force was the Hospitality Association. And so using this database that you see here, that is from the uh, National Institute of Money and Politics, the group that we worked with in 1998 that put up the first database of South Carolina campaign exposures, you can go in and you can search on, a, uh, on, an, on an industry and you can search on a candidate and you can determine how much money was given to certain groups and how they, uh-oh, an unexpected error has occurred. Well, I'll keep talking before I hit this. It may go away. But this, this document here is pages long of people that, that gave money, the food and beverage industry and uh, the hospital association and others that gave money to the governor and to the Ways and Means Committee and to the Senate Finance Committee that made the decisions about the budget. The, and and the, the, this were driven by the Restaurant Association. Oh, it didn't go away. And so you can scroll through this and you can see which legislators got this. I made this up. I mean, they, do, they, they will do custom work for you there. But you can see the legislators here that got stuff, what party they're in. You can see where it came from. And you can see how much, look at this, look at this, look at this. $1,000 is all the House members could get. But look at the, oh my God, this goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And you get down to the point here. And this is just a, during one session, the session that ended in 2020 during the COVID thing. And the these industries, lodging and tourism, um, I need to go through and clean some of this up, food and beverage and all. This That, that number there is $16 million that were given to, to the, these legislators here. And so this is the type of thing that the skills session will teach you how to use these databases, how to connect those important dots to actually have a substantive argument about who's making the laws here and whose benefit they, they, they're, whose interests they're in. So that kind of takes us from the tactics and the strategies to the skills session, Robert. So proceed. Oh, yes, definitely. And, and that, let, me, let, let, let me interrupt you. We will, after we wrap the next couple slides we're going through here that covers more or less the topics. We want to hear from some of our officers in terms of what, why the hell they're staying with us at this point. And, uh, and they're all Majeska School graduates too. And then open it up for discussion. So y'all bear with us for a while. We've got another hour. Sure. And, you know, to that point, um, again, uh, with, with skills in particular, one thing that I want to really emphasize this evening is that your message must reflect our strategy rather than be reactive. Uh, you want to make sure that you're you're staying ahead of the game in terms of thinking about the problems and issues facing a community and that it's not just a matter of responding to a, a a crisis but instead trying to help shape the terms of debate and dialogue on the ground um, again this was an, an issue just going back to say the civil rights movement one of the reasons why some of those tactics were successful was they took advantage of a national and regional context. The context of the Cold War, of course, the context of Cold War liberalism and the like, um, but also the tactics took advantage of a, a space within the public sphere for a certain kind of religious viewpoint of life that is not as common today in terms of thinking of civil disobedience and nonviolent protest and resistance. But to Brett's point about actually understanding things like how a budget works on a state, national, or local level, or knowing who's funding which politicians with how much money, this goes back to skills and tools. You have to understand the importance of studying laws and regulations at every level, federal, state, county, and municipal. And of course, a lot of our work in the progressive network deals with municipal and local levels, but we, all, we also wanna make sure we keep taking into account federal and state as well. Again, it depends on what kind of, of battle you're entering into, but you do want to understand the laws that you're dealing with as well. Um, make sure you know how to actually do research. Connect the dots, as the, the, the slide here says. Make sure that you know where to look for information, how to process that information, 
in how to digest that information for other members of your community. So it's not just a bunch of gobbledygook, but instead it makes sense. So you can explain it to them in a way that is, is accessible for everyone. Of course, you should also develop, and this actually almost feels like a, a thing just for the humanities in general. You're developing better communication skills, being able to learn how to read and write effectively. These are skills that seem pretty basic. Uh, they seem very commonplace, but they actually are not, even when in spaces of organizing and activism. And to be on top of your game as community organizers means being able to actually use all these various tools as effectively as possible. And so this brings us to talking about the practical and really getting at what the goals are for the Majestic School at the end of our semester. Um, and of course, what we're expecting of the graduates here is to be effective citizens for one, to, to use the information knowledge you've learned so far to be effective, thoughtful citizens, because goodness knows if there's one thing we're short on right now is effective and thoughtful citizenship. And we want graduates who, who will be, of course, willing to sign up for you know, skills workshops and things like that, and will undertake a, an actual practicum to put your skills into place. Now, and of course, I, you know, Brett, you can chime in as well on these, these practicums, but the thing is with the practicums, um, you can choose to work on existing progressive network projects, which could include research, working in the field, a combination of the two. Um, and the thing with the practicums in these projects is that each of the projects embodies different aspects of the progressive network's goals, uh, missions, and our overall commitment to a certain moral and revolutionary vision for the state of South Carolina. Or if you have an idea for a project, you're more than welcome to propose an idea as well. That again, links to the network's guiding principles and our strategies as well. Okay, so with that being said, you're probably wondering well, what kind of projects do they have in mind for us? What, they're, what are they currently up to right now? Um, here is just a, a brief list of projects. And again, this is what Brett was talking about by inviting some of the officers in the Progressive Network to talk a bit more about what the organization is, is up to right now. Um, and these are, these are projects that have been going on for some time now. Uh, you have the Racial Profiling Project, which actually research disparities in, in law enforcement throughout South Carolina. You may recall, I think from our last class, that we actually took a look at some of the data compiled by the Racial Profiling Project. Uh, the Missing Voter Project, this has become really important in recent years um, to really figure out how we can reach voters in South Carolina who quite simply are not voting. Now, for years, uh, many folks in South Carolina have argued that the state could actually be a much more competitive state if we simply found a way to tap into the tens of thousands of voters in the state who simply do not go to the polls every two to four years. And with the Missing Voter Project, what we're trying to do here is to figure out why they aren't going to the polls and to give them the resources and tools to actually get to the polls and to make informed decisions about who they want to vote for. Uh, you also got projects like the Democracy SC Project, uh, which is focused on voting rights, election protection, and campaign finance reform, and things like that. Um, I think if memory serves, this also encompasses some of the redistricting work that we've been doing for some time now as well. Um, of course, there are other projects like researching and compiling statistics for the other projects and also hands-on volunteer work with uh, remodeling the headquarters in Columbia, South Carolina, helping up with network administration, helping up with Majestic School or other projects. So again, this is just a short list of some of the projects that the Progressive Network is currently up to right now, and some of the projects that we're hoping that folks will sign on to help out with as part of their practicum. Now, uh, to kind of close out talking about the, the practicums and such, I, I do Robert, want to- <laughs> excuse, excuse me. Um, I wanted to lift up a couple of things about the, go back to the uh, practicum list. Now, what you're seeing here, folks, these are general topics. We've got other projects that would fall underneath these. 
these general topics are things that we haven't been able to do well, but there's really they're really well resourced and they could do better. Some of them have done better than others. And we have other projects that we've taken on and some of them have come out of classes that aren't in this list. What's in this list are things that you can do forever all the time as opposed to like a blog thing or a, a tour of monuments. And that not to say those aren't valuable, but these are these are things that there's databases. The racial profiling project, there's not only do we have a database, there's one posted at the Department of, of uh, 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 the, uh, the Department of, what's it called? Uh, uh, DPS, safety. Department of Public Safety. The High Patrol runs it. And so this is like a state thing we made that's up there. Ain't going away. Nobody's using it right. Missing Voter Project, this is data that we have a tremendous understanding of that we can give you the names of the people on your block that didn't vote, that are registered, that lied to you and told you they voted. Okay? We can give you the names of people on your street that have three children, a, high school, a college degree, and no car. We have that type of research ability to be able to arm you to do things in these projects. The Democracy Project is something that covers a whole waterfront of voter education, voter mobilization, understanding redistricting, voter... Re and we're, we're, we are the group that has the lead edge on that because we've been doing it for long enough to where we know the people in various counties that are your directors and that we're able to do the... Uh, the work in terms of also in the legislature as well as behind the scenes in terms of fixing things. And so this research and statistics applies to all the pro pro projects. And that was like the follow the money stuff. That was like knowing how to look up laws and rules and regulations. And so these are generic tasks that can inform whatever work you're doing. And I just want to make that clear that these aren't, these aren't things that have a, a shelf life on them. These are bodies of skills and tools that you can use. And uh, the, uh, the other thing that, that is, I think, worth mentioning is that our longevity has allowed us to be able to have relationships that is really important that get transferred and that we need to have people coming up that want to meet who their county director is on the election commission or we know, to, to understand the individuals that are, in, to most civilian citizens, the people that are in authority that run your life, you don't go knock on their door and talk to them. But like the, the uh, racial profiling project is something you can use, go knock on the door and talk to the chief of police. But that we also have relationships with the state law enforcement division that allow us to intervene when your local police are stepping on your First Amendment rights. We've had uh, well, wonderful uh, experiences in being able to use SLED to stop local cops from messing with people doing protests that's First Amendment protection. So those are some of the, the things when we're talking about projects, you, you, you've got a basket of skills that you can use to apply to your projects. So Robert, that was my point. Thank you. Yeah, and again, this is um, a good way for us to, because we're going to talk more about the projects in just a second, but uh, as the last slide reminds us, as Ms. Simkin can tell us if she were here right now, ladies and gentlemen, this is no sitting down time. And I, as I said at the start of this conversation this evening, just take a step back for a second, even putting aside the Majestic School. Think about what we have experienced as a community over the last year. Uh, we've had this COVID-19 pandemic. We've had the resurgence of Black Lives Matter. We've had a controversial election, which uh, led to an unprecedented, at least on a national level, coup attempt in the nation's capital. And yet all these problems are still with us. And, and you go back to the previous slide, again, you look at how much of this deals with the basic nuts and bolts of having a functioning democracy, for example, or it deals with nuts and bolts of things like racial profiling or just understanding the kind of state that we live in. There are so many different ways that each of us can make a difference as community organizers through the progressive network. The goal now is for each of us to figure out where, where do I fit in? What can I do to contribute to this larger effort to actually make South Carolina for the first time in its history, or at least for some in a long time, a genuine, actual democracy? Dr. Green, I wanted to um, have our, at least give our 
our co-chairs, is, I, is, I don't know if Carol's with us. Is, is Carol with us this evening? Carol Singletary? Um, Carol's one of our co-chairs. Amori Fox, one of our co-chairs. Kyle Kreminger and Marjorie Hammond. <clears throat> A chance for them to say what it is that they value about the network. What have they learned? Why they're still working with us? Because we've only got less than 45 minutes left and we really i really want to get to the floor to, to hear some questions and observations so why don't we start with kyle because he can break the ice can you hear me now Fred? i i listen to you lovingly my friend <laughs> well just two quick comments like you said we're running out of time but um what i appreciate most about the network and, and have appreciated about the network for so long is a, a thoughtful analysis and understanding of the way democracy works, should work, I should say, in our state and country, that that power, talk, going back to what you mentioned earlier about power, that power, you build it at the local and state level first, that so much oxygen gets sucked, sucked out of the room by what is or is not happening uh, in Washington, D.C. And as you mentioned earlier, Brett, you know, doesn't matter who is president, we're not going to move the needle on who represents you in DC until we change the way the lines are drawn, until we undo gerrymandering, until we take power at the state level. So that's first. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention is I'm, along with Marjorie Hammett, one of the co-chairs of the network's education fund. And so that's our nonpartisan wing. But beyond nonpartisanship, I always Appreciate the network's anti-partisan or transpartisan um, strategy and tactics. That you know, we Brad, you can tell the story better than me about how in 2016 we endorsed just a couple of candidates, and on the Republican side, they were. <laughs> it's a long story, but we interviewed the candidates who were facing off against Lee Bright. Some of you may know the name, the Senator Lee Bright from Spartan, formerly formerly the former senator from um, Spartanburg, and we. In, looked at the candidates who were against him. We didn't agree with anything pretty much that Scott Talley stood for, but we said, well, you're not insane, so therefore we'll endorse you. And he won. He won 321 votes. He beat out Lee Bright and our members in Spartanburg. We sent them to the polls for Talley because there was nobody on the Democratic side to vote for. If they didn't vote in the Republican primary in 2016, they would have had no voice. So we sent them to the polls and he won. And Ta Scott Talley knows that. And then on the Democratic side, we had Mike Fanning, who's been a member of the network since 2010, run against basically a do-nothing Democrat. Again, endorsed him. He won by the hair on his chinny chin chin, and he knows that. And so he's in the network. He is a, continues to be a network member, and is in. He's the only senator in what we're calling Gilda's group, Gilda's gang, Gilda Cobb Hunter, Representative Gilda Cobb Hunter's group of uh, Progressive Legislative Caucus. And so, yeah, that's the way you build power. So we've had victories. We've got the analysis and understanding and the, the relationships. And we're, we've been doing it for 25 years and 26 years now. And so thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you, Kyle. I can't believe it's been 26 years. Marjorie, do you, you, if you unmute yourself, you can share some memories that you may still retain. Find your button. Call your daughter. So, Marja, while you're finding your button, we're going to let Omari pitch in a couple of words. Oh, she there she is. There she is. You can hear me. All right. Well, again, um, I was introduced to the network. Uh, by a couple of other kind of unruly people. And they suggested particularly that I might be able to get along with Brett. Um, I had moved here, by the way, just from Brooklyn, New York, and I was uncomfortable living here at the time and not really finding a place for me. Um, but, uh, overwhelmed and excited about the information I was learning about being with my brothers and sisters in large numbers uh, and doing stuff 
And really it was the doing stuff that the network was doing that I was able to ease into. And so again, and learning a lot of stuff and I thought I was cool. I mean, I thought I knew it all uh, in terms of my history with CORE and New York City and political places in New York. Um, but again, it was an incredible lesson and it was a very, very good um, introduction, an easy introduction in terms of the information. So the network provided with me um, a way in which to fit in again. Um, what? Go ahead. I was just going to say, you make it sound like you've only been here a minute, and I think it's been several, well, more than several decades. I moved. I moved in 79. But again, it always, it does seem like a minute. Time flies. <laughs> Marjorie is a, a, a master social worker who's had, held high office in the National Social Work Association as well as the Black Social Work Association and started a social work program at the Department of Corrections back when it was a kinder, gentler Department of Corrections. We've, it's really gone backwards, folks. But Marjorie, Marjorie's, Marjorie's got some scars. She's been in the trenches, and she's been a real asset to the network. I didn't fun. mean to shut you, off, shut you off. Go for it. No, just saying, been fun. Okay. And I have my colleagues, um, like the, like the so-called newcomers, who, who remind me of political stances and ways in which they can uh, address serious problems have been extremely helpful. Thank you, Comrade Hammock. You know who you are. <laughs> yeah, Jean's out there feeling uncomfortable now. Uh, Marjorie has another hammock that's come to town, a, a Yankee fleeing south for reasons we don't know yet, but we're not going to drive her off. Mr. Fox, what'd you learn? Why are you here? Um, I guess my I've been in with the network for five years now. Um, I started out, uh, so God bless the day, um, Joe Neal. I came to um, one of the Ferguson protests and I met um, Carolina Peace who had meetings at um, the Majeska House. And then that's where I met Joe Neal, who christened uh, Simple Justice, the name of the one of the original Black Lives Matter chapters um, in South Carolina. And at one point it was an official chapter with the national organization. So from there, from meeting Joe Neal and um, what happened was the simple justice meetings would be meet the hour before the, the network meetings. So the members were already, um, the simple justice members told me that I needed to join the network and just hang out, come to the second meeting. So I started coming to the network meetings and um, probably I'm so as, as the, I think the thing that keeps the, the graduates of this class who who will repeat offenders, if you will, is some um, being a part of that framework. Like we all have an idea or our energy, but I learned how to channel it um, with tactics. I had decent tactics and I had a pretty good sense of, you know, navigating the terrain and articulating, you know, where people needed to go. But these deeper dives um, statistically and certainly um, being clear about resistance that we have to have, you know, in terms of things like fair maps and just other battles where the wind might not be immediately within grasp, but still understanding why you still have to fight it sometimes. Um, I think that's what the game is missing from, from organizing is um, people come in these waves of a national event and then locally join something for a period of time and, you know, even from the folks I started out with, I was rocking with BLM pretty much since Trayvon Martin and always an organizer of some resistance and black liberation before that. But um, I'm one of the few people, you know, I don't really know a lot of people that I started out with. 
and then certainly augmenting what I already brought to the table and going to the Jessica School. Um, the cl classes, not only are they educational, but they become like this cultural sense of belonging, this, this thing you feel like you want to collect a mission with your comrades and your classmates. So I think um, what I'm always excited to see is how we can channel it um, at the end of the course to see, see what some of the new, new blood can bring to the table, um, either to infuse yourselves into the projects we already have, or if you feel like you got a unique twist, um, you know, that's the type of energy that we're looking for. Um, so if you don't see something on our slate, but you can still bring it to the floor, you know, I'll say, um, let's make it do what it do. You know, I'm certain that one of our comrades will find some interest. And once you got some uh, smaller cadre of interest, and again, articulate the strategy and mission and outcomes, you know, I think that people are looking for a voice. The last thing I'll say is um, a little bit of what I talked about in the chat. I think once we can overcome some of those divisions that I think are just kind of interwoven into the South Carolina organizing culture in terms of black, white, gender, older, younger, um, I feel like that's where a lot of the winning can happen and certainly the education piece, you know, that we can impart to the citizens, you know, that's definitely, um, Wheelhouse is a word that we we recently been used in, but um, I think that's the strength of the organization, this class and the ability to teach people how to organize. So that's what keeps me a part of it is um, I like being clear about my strategy and also feel that sense of belonging, you know, I, like I'm going to war with people that I trust who are going to be in it for the long haul. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Mr. Fox gets this concept of the beloved community. Trust me, folks, we may not get to the top of the mountain, but along the way, we damn well need friends. And we damn well need people that make us happy, that we can dance with. And so, you know, we bought a building that's your building, um, and it's in the network's name. And so it's a beloved community center that's going to be our headquarters for hopefully several generations, many generations to come. And Dr. Green, before we go to the floor, we've got 30 minutes left, and I wanted to give Rebecca Robbins, our incredibly competent communications director, and full disclosure, my lovely wife, an opportunity to say something, and I hope that it's not critical about me, but we share that. Becky? Um, I feel like I'm going to cry because everybody keeps talking about community and it's such a um, powerful word for me because that's the only reason I'm here. And I grew up overseas and came to South Carolina to go to college and felt really out of place and totally unmoored. And when I went into the Grow Building for the first time and met Brett for the first time, I looked around me at this funky ass building and all these posters and this weird energy and this eclectic bunch of people that were just so colorful and so passionate and so um, wild and, and warm and beautiful. And um, I felt like I was home. And I hope that, that that is my hope for all of you that is on this call, that anybody that goes to the Majeska School, whether you're from here or not, it's easy to feel oppressed in South Carolina. It's really easy to feel discouraged, um, demoralized, outgunned, outmanned, out everything. But if you surround yourself with people who believe the same things that you are, that you do, that it's, it, um, makes it bearable. It, that's my experience. I don't, I'm kind of intense. Um, so I'm, I'm not like everybody else that may be on this call, but for me, it's been a lifeline and a lifesaver to find a purpose. And I really appreciate the network for 
giving that to me and for Point Newspaper for giving me an outlet to express myself. myself. And I think that there's an opportunity for whatever your passion is, whatever your interest is, whatever your skill level is, um, that there's a place for you here and there's a place for you to make your life meaningful. And there are a lot of ways to do that. You don't have to do that in the network, but this is a place that's got a lot of um, resources for people that really want to do right. And um, God bless you all for being here. It makes me happy to be in your company and um, power to the people, y'all. All power. Thank you, Becky. Dr. Green, I'm going to let you handle any kind of how you want to do the questions. You want to open the mic? You want the people raise their hands? Take it. Uh, let's just go ahead and just open the mic. I mean, I'm, I'm sure folks have uh, plenty of questions after this evening. They should raise their uh, hand there, right? Yeah, so just go ahead and just use the function of, of raising your hand on the screen, and we can just go from there. How do you do that? I forgot. Reactions? Um, Under reactions. No. Yeah, raise hands. There's a reaction button, and you can hit that and raise your hand, or just uh, raise your physical hand. Look at Quadro Gallman over there right, waving at us. <laughs> I actually have a question. Um, Go ahead, please. You you actually uh, stimulated me with this uh, tonight. I'm a member of an organization called the Catalyst and Bongi, which is, uh, I've talked to uh, Brett about it in, uh, in the past. And uh, we recently, created a nonpartisan political wing. Uh, I'm not, even though I was the uh, convener, convener of that organization, uh, someone else is leading that arm. And in looking at some of the planned activities and trainings, my question is, could uh, people who did not attend uh, this class go to any of those trainings? Dr. Green, you, I'll respond to that. Yes, Dr. Gallman. Um, it, say the name of that group again that you're doing. The Catalyst Mbangi. Mbangi? Mbangi. Spell it for me, please. M-B-O-N-G-I. And for those of us that are culturally deprived, what does that mean, sir? Uh, the, an Mbangi is a Central African concept of uh, community, um, whether it be community uh, leadership, community decision making, community, just community. Yeah. And uh, so basically it's, uh, and, and I mentioned to you uh, when you gave permission to co-sign letter that we wrote to the uh, state newspaper in defense of Dr. Linda Bell mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when she was getting so much heat. Uh, Thank you, sir. And people need to know that, that Dr. Gallman, he's a, a medical doctor, he's a, my gastroenterologist who's helped keep me alive to much people's chagrin. But he came into the Grove building probably 40 years ago with things to print. And he is the center of South Carolina, at least Columbia's Afrocentrism, and he's just a terrific resource. And the answer to your question is, Dr. Gallman, sure, we want to have the, the skill sessions to be kind of like a la carte. People can come in and take them, or we're going to charge a few bucks, but that the people that want to pursue this kind of like graduate level organizing class have to go through the Majeska School. And you can't just come in and learn how to use a database to go do some voter mobilization thing you want to do. You know I mean, you can. You can't. You can't use any of our tools in a partisan fashion. You can use your knowledge however you want to use it, but you can't use our tools. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we will articulate that opportunity as soon as the class is over, where they have a chance to take a breath and probably arrange things to start no sooner than September. Okay. Thank you, sir. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, and. Um... And Ian had a, a good question to chat about uh, how do we stay in touch after the class is over with? And I think that's actually a good question for us to discuss right now. I know that in the past, folks have just done the old fashioned way by, by getting 
contact information from each other when the class comes to an end. But um, Brad or anybody else wants to chime in, like how are we going to keep in touch after the class is over? Well, yeah, I'll comment on that. If Becky's got something to add, she can. Um, number one is that there's nobody in this class that should not have paid their network dues. I mean, the cheapest you can get away with is, is $10 a year. You can actually pay that at three dollars and thirty four cents a, a year and we'll kick you back the extra penny. But the, once you sign on to be a network member, you will get our regular email. You will know what's happening. You can stay involved if you're in Columbia or if you're willing to drive. Uh, certainly by September, we'll have our beloved community center open next door to Majeska Simpkins house and uh, the hours will be posted and we're going to have people there. And we're going to have a little cafe where you can come in and have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine, find out what's going on, and not go to yet another dang meeting. And so there are different ways that you can stay in touch, but simply being a member of the network and, and getting the e-list and sending an email to network at scprodet.com or come in my the, the office in Columbia would be ways to do that, Ian, or any of you for that matter. Becky? Yeah. Um, let me just add that we have a Facebook page for the Majeska School, and I would think that we might consider, uh, you know, a, a Facebook page is kind of more of like the corporate face of an organization, but we could do a Majeska group, which would be, we have a network group that all of y'all, please join us online if you are on social media. Um, because I think that's a really good way, A, to stay in touch, share information, and um, kind of, you know, create a community. But we could do that for the, the Majeska School in particular, if folks want to do that. And the other thing to do that, you know, would be easy as well is just create a Google list serve or a, a Google group or some kind of group where folks in either just this class or all graduates could be invited to join. So I think that's a great question, Ian. We'll you know, figure out the best way that most people might want to do that. We'll talk about that um, before we graduate. All right, excellent. Uh, any other questions this evening? Omari, go ahead, please. So I'm going to do a petition against you, Dr. Green, to do the discussion on Judas and the Black Messiah. So um, I'm going to email you it. I have over 100 signatures right now. And um, when I get to 102, I demand that you set a date time and I'll get to the facility. So uh, that's my that's my story okay. I'm sticking with. I, I'm certainly fine with that. You know, we'll just figure out a date and time and go from there. So that's that's totally fine with me. That is a reference to Fred Hampton. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably the only one in this meeting this evening that actually was in the presence of Fred Hampton in, 19, in October before he was killed in December in Chicago. I was at the trial, the Chicago 7 trial, and Fred did a press conference downstairs from the trial. Tremendous loss, but it exemplifies the extent to which the people that are in control will go to retain control. Thank I you, Lord. I had a meeting also, Brett. Go for us. We I had was a... just telling you, I had a meeting with him also. But you, met, you met Fred? Yes, yes. The man was, what, 22, <laughs> one when he was killed? Mm -hmm. and, and, and J. Edgar Hoover said, we got to take this guy out because he was really good. And so y'all, yeah, y'all need to make sure you don't stand too tall. Somebody gonna shoot at you. There's a, there was a, a very active, very progressive group of Panthers in um, a section of Brooklyn where I were, where I lived actually, and he was being nurtured by them. Well, that's great. That's great. She's been around the block. Y'all surely have some questions, observations, criticisms, hopes, or dreams, or something to share with us. I think the entire group has the same reaction I have right now. Of, well, there are people in the room who were in the room with Fred Hampton or met Fred Hampton. I'm still kind of processing that myself right now. But. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Goldman, you have another question? I just wanted to, to point out about Fred Hampton. 
one of the reasons that he was killed was he was doing what you're doing, Brett. He was mobilizing a multiracial coalition. Brother, man, if I was black, I'd been dead a long time ago, okay? I mean, I know that for a fact. I mean, I, I, I was just simply beaten up in police custody for being a nigger lover. And now, if I'd been one of them people that was beating me up for being loving, I'd be dead. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I appreciate you noticing. <laughs> you know, actually, if, if no one else has a question as of yet, I do have a, a question uh, for, for Brett and Becky and others in the organization. Um, very quickly, which is, which is going back to tonight's conversation about organizing and strategy and tactics. Are there any, any tips on organizing in terms of things that people shouldn't do if they're community organizers? Like things that you've seen folks do in the past that backfired. Shouldn't be, should not be doing. Yes. Well, I'll take the first bite at that. Um, one of the things that that saddens me, and I, I I can't throttle somebody for doing it, is continuing to believe the Democratic Party, as it exists, is going to lead them to the promised land. And I don't have any problem with Democrats. I'm a Democrat. I mean, I'm small D Democrat. I have to vote large D Democrat. I have a real problem with the Democratic Party Incorporated, which is driven by money and power and mostly white men. And so the thing to ward against is getting sucked up and, and running on the track too long to try and make the system that is hurting us nicer. Unless you're also doing the outside game to change the system. So we can have an inside-outside game. I have been a delegate in every Democratic convention, I think, except maybe I was out of the country one time, since 1978. So I'm an inside force that's a real pain in their ass, but I'm also an outside force that's trying to take, I want the people they have. I don't want their, I don't want their institution. The same thing with the, basically with other institutions that will remain nameless. I'm not buying into the institution. I want the people that are looking to that institution to lead them to the promised land to work with us on systemic change. Rebecca, you got something to say now? I would like to um, piggyback on that just to ward against um, the, the, the excitement and enthusiasm that comes in South Carolina during primary season and everybody, all the progressives, and it was never more apparent than the last election cycle when they split off their candidate silos. And so you've got the Bernie people and then you've got the Hillary people and you've got, that was, that was the last iteration of this thing. And it was really destructive for us as an organization because we're, you know, nonpartisan. Um, and so we were trying to um, coalesce the people that still believe in the same values, but we've got different ways of getting there. And then, then there was like this infighting that was so vicious and so, um, debilitating and some of the relationships that we had before the last election cycle have not been repaired this stuff lasts and so i would beg of you anybody that's doing electoral politics work to keep the big picture in mind and 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 grant each other a little grace if your candidate is not exactly their candidate that you know you can't afford to stay in those camps after the election cycle because there are too few of us doing this work in South Carolina, and you've got to get the big picture, find the common ground when you can, fight like hell when you have to, but when the fight is over, concede, come back together. And I, I, that, that is my biggest concern is like the electoral politics in South Carolina is so destructive in the long haul for mm -hmm. us trying to keep the long haul vision. That's all. Thank you, Becky. I can testify the pain that's caused her and us but that that we have we we do we have a pol political action committee called SC Provost. But you've heard Kyle say that we're either transpartisan or anti-partisan because we believe that, that as George Washington and several other founding fathers warned, don't start parties, don't start parties, and we did. And so we need to recognize that the parties themselves are problem. California now has a primary that's nonpartisan. 
the top candidates run against each other. There could be two Democrats or two Republicans. There's so much more that makes sense than buying into this partisan stuff. And um, Robert, uh, Ian has his hand up. Go ahead, Ian. I see your hands raised. Hey, yeah. Um, uh, I was just just curious, like, like what? Um, how do I say this? Like, like what? Uh, in in road con- connections, the, uh, the 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 network it's itself has um, with the the other groups that are that are organizing the the people around here. Like, I I know that. That, for example, you, you've got uh, things like the um, uh, USC SJP uh, down in in Columbia up here. You, you've got the Upstate Food Not Not, not Bombs. Um, there's a Charleston chapter of Food Not Not Bombs as well, um, and uh, Charleston as well. There's a uh, DSA that's fairly active uh th- things like like that i'm i'm just uh a, a little curious like like where that has um gone that <clears throat> a number of security and thank you for the question um uh, several years ago and it would be before this rather fuzzy period that happened when trump became president and the pandemic came um we recognize the need to try and reorganize the progressive network. The organizations that you mentioned are, have been, and some still are, especially Food Not Bombs, participants within our 501c3. The organizations that are part of the work that we're doing have to be nonpartisan. The, so the, you've got the C3 nonpartisan work, you've got the C4 individuals that can go off and do things they want to. But that we started the C3 before the before the internet we were a progressive network we were actually a network we had a statewide newspaper um and we'd been on the ground for more than 20 years at that point and i you know, picked up people like that majeska's you know colleagues that had been on the ground for 50 years before that so we really were a network and our, and we had probably it several times during the 25 year history 50 or 60 organizations that were part of the C3 progressive network. Right, right. They've um, gone, they're gone. They're gone. We have so yeah. few now that they're mostly national organizations that, that a few years back, we said we've got to reorganize our structures. Our bylaws need to be changed to, to accommodate, to figure this out. And that what we're looking at now, and this is a work in progress that we're trying to get back onto after this long the hard spell of the pandemic and Mr. Trump, to be able to have the C3 be more focused on doing research and education, an institute that is a policy institute that does a Majeska school, does the research and stuff, and let the C4, the individual action actors, take on membership that can include organizations, and that we would, as a whole, partner with certain groups to do certain things but that the education fund itself, our policy and research group, would be more of a, um, a think tank doing professional level stuff. Like we're, we're the only advisory group providing progressive information to the legislature. I mean, in other states, there's all like whole groups that have buildings and staff and money that do that. So we need to focus on, this is important, we focus on what's not being done. And so if somebody's protecting gay rights, that's great, we'll support them, somebody's doing the women's rights. But what we know isn't being done is providing the analytical basis, research and tools and all to people to be organizers in whatever field they're working in. And so your question about those groups, I went personally for every month to Greenville and Spartanburg for uh, 10, 11, 12 years until I was the only one there sometimes. The, 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 we gave up on Greenville a long time ago, but what we need is we need individual members to do that organically. We can't run that from Columbia. In Charleston, what happened was they had a group that got out from under us where they, weren't, they were not plugged in at all into our strategy. Whoever walked into the Charleston Progressive Network meeting with the idea of who we're going to picket and protest the next day, that's what they did, and that's not what we support. And so there has to be 
people like Majeska School graduates that understand our strategy and understand how productive it can be, that are tied into resources that collectively work on things. We've got to have those people in the places where we raise up a community that works on things. And so we kind of shut down the chapters. We're backing off on having C3 organizations involved in the C3 board and figuring out a new mechanism to go forward with. We're going to come out with that, hopefully <laughs> spend some time after the school's over with and have statewide meetings, maybe on Zoom. I'm looking forward to having another statewide meeting at Penn Center in the not too distant future to be able to figure out, okay, now how do we deal with this new century and this new generation and this, it, it, the things that we're dealing with after 25-year-old um, bylaws? And I hope that answers most of your question. Stay tuned. It's a work in progress. Anybody, Becky or I Kyle, have something to add to that? Marjorie, you got something to add to that? No, I don't. I have another. Okay, well, well what, in, what Wayne had it, Ian, finish up. Oh, sorry. In in that that sense, like like when you say partisan, it's um, like I, I I say this because I I know that, that there's a now like well I I'm I'm beginning to to realize per per, per se that, that that there's a fairly large like con contingent of uh of of Palestinian uh re re refugees and. It, immigrants that have like settled in in places like uh Gre greenville right mm -hmm. and uh so so when you say partisan uh, that what what exactly does that mean as as like the the um uh palestinian gen genocide project continues to de de develop just in like the the last month or so right yeah let's um, like let's, let's let's make let's wrap this up because ian i appreciate your question the, uh, Palestine, the rights for Palestinians is not a partisan issue. I mean, the, that, that's something the United Nations decided in 1970 and something that I, I, was at the, I was at a United Nations conference in 1984 as the only white male American at a conference, a world conference on racism. It was the second bicentennial conference on racism that there were only three countries in the world that didn't participate. It was Israel because of Zionism had been declared uh, racism. South Africa, because apartheid was racism, in the United States. And so the Palestinian issue is not partisan. When I'm saying partisan, I'm talking about the Democratic Party Incorporated or the Republican Party Incorporated, or what I believe is kind of a failed effort in a two-party country that doesn't have a parliamentary structure to think that you can save yourself with a third party. We can't do that right now. And so that, if that doesn't answer your question, we'll deal with it offline. We're running out of time. And Wayne's got his hand up, and then Marjorie has something to say. Wayne, be short and clever. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Short and clever, as usual. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so my question has to do with uh, media and just information. So the point was a newspaper that was run and done, I think, for a number of years. I read a few uh, before, and I think very fantastic. How do we, or or has there been any ideas around um, somehow teaching that citizen journalism, restarting some kind of citizen led? Um, news newspaper or or like uh e newsletter kind of thing well wayne i'm glad that becky stepped away from her computer and didn't hear that question because that's been something that she's been mad at me about for 25 years now the, the, those of you that don't know the the grove started a, a newspaper and uh, uh 1990 and Becky came in and she had an article and she was a master. She had the master's work at, at, in journalism. She does experience in journalism. And she had an article she wrote when she was working with the, the Bar Association. They wouldn't run because it was about AIDS and AIDS was like God's punishment for gay people. And we ran it, of course, under the condition that she took over the newspaper. And so we started the newspaper essentially to facilitate building a progressive coalition around the state as that progressive coalition became the progressive network and it took more of my time the newspaper got less time and so becky's been mad at me for a couple of decades now at losing the newspaper 
And so your question of how we start a newspaper, you should talk to Becky about, and she will dissuade you of a very difficult effort of content and con continuity. But there are ways that we can use the social media that, that we printed up to 35,000 copies of paper a month for, uh, for 11 years. And Becky or I or friends would drive them and put them in paper boxes in Charleston and Greenville, and we UPS them all over the state. Thank God we don't have to do that now. So reaching, using media to do that is something that we need to do. And I'm probably one of the worst problems that I've had is not using social media like Facebook and Twitter. And that it's been a real problem because I've influenced some comrades around me that they think it's not useful. It really has to be. We've got to use the social media. And Becky's really been beating on us for that and we haven't responded and i hope there's a bunch of people in this class that will see working on social media as one of their practicums away and then that's where you fit in yeah well just just a quick follow-up um because i think that even doing it as a perhaps like an e in like an email newsletter situation but have contributors from around the state so that we don't in, in a way much like the state pamphlet or the cursed post and courier, um, you know, focus so centrally on just what we consider to be major cities or major regions. Uh, people live all over this state. And you know, as we've seen and discussed multiple times, everyone's feeling quite ignored. Uh, An excellent practicum project. Let's talk about that at that you. practical meeting. Marjorie? Um, just quickly, and this is very different. Um, the 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 project that we had going on in the in in the prison was a black history class largely and a black history reading and i simply want to say that all of my volunteers and they were statewide came largely from dr goldman's recommendation and organization so i just wanted to give kudos to to that okay May he live long enough to get blessings more than he deserves. Robert, take over. Yeah, can I just add something? Oh, quick? I'm sorry, Becky. Sure. I didn't hear Wayne's question exactly, but I had an idea that it had to do with having our own media, right? So, oh, yeah. Um, I, I really think that this is a, a critical point, and I don't want to take up any time about it, but it, it really, without having some outlets to to, and you can have the greatest message in the world, and we know this from firsthand experience, that you can work on something for a year, have all the data, all the information, you present it beautifully, you have a press conference, everybody, you know, it, it, there just are not enough newspapers, there are not enough reporters, all this journalism is dying, if you haven't noticed, your newspaper is shrinking, there are a few people in the field covering stuff, so we have got, this is really imperative, if you're going to survive in the next decade, please hear me that you have got to have your own outlets for presenting your own media. And it doesn't have to be a newspaper. If it is beautiful, but that's such a commitment and it's so hard to do to, to really pull off long-term. Um, but in the meantime, we have a blog, Wayne, that we could use to, to put your state of the youth report to, on when it is completed someday. And that there are like ways that we can use the existing tools that we have our email list, there are 3,000 plus people on our email list. If somebody wants to create content in this group or in the broader network community, we have ways to get that message out. Um, it isn't a newspaper, but there's other ways to do this. And so, and you could, anything that you put on, if you were to put it on the blog, we can boost that, but by putting it out on Twitter, out on Facebook, out on our e-list. So, the problem is content, and that has always been the problem with media. So everybody thinks it's great to have a newspaper, but who's going to write this stuff? It's it's a lot of work, people. It is a lot of work to do it well. And so you know, I let's let's do this, and I'd be glad to help however I can. Seriously, but but um, let's use the tools that we have. Let's just start there. Grant over. You're here. Hey, right. I have something. I'm sorry to, to interrupt and I'm probably illustrating the point that I'm trying to make, but as I just want to maybe encourage 
the white folks in this space to check the way that we show up in this space and like let's make sure that we're not talking over people and especially not black and brown people watch the language that we're using and respect people's historical trauma because like i think there are some words that we should never ever ever use no matter what like there are words that should never be uttered by white people and that's all i want to say I think there have been a few times that a few of us have said some things, have blamed people, have critiqued um, Black-led action in particular, and we have no agency to do such a thing. It's not our place to do that. Okay. <laughs> Received. All right, now those are some very, very thoughtful words to, to help us close out this evening. Now, now I know it's 8.30, well, 8.32 right now, and I can literally hear some thunder outside my window at the moment. <laughs> um, so I know that we're wrapped out of time. Um, Jean Hammack, I know your, your hand is also raised. Did you want to add something before we close out this I, evening? Uh, I just wanted to um, just tell Brett in particular that this weekend, Marge and I, well, it was, yes, this weekend, Marge and I were at a graduation for a young lady, and we met the daughters of Reverend Whitaker. One happens to be a journalist, and she who has moved back to South Carolina. Um, and I've contacted her, and hopefully, uh, we'll get, sit down with her and talk about her experiences. Okay. Well, thank you, Jean. Let's follow up on that. And Melissa, your, your point warrants a whole nother class and a discussion, and we should we should do that. We should make ourselves do that. Um, Dr. Green, do you want to wrap and let people that want to talk stay, and we can let Daniel play the music that gives us a chance to go to the bathroom and get another beverage? Is that where sure. we are? Yes. <laughs> and I want to tell people, the people that everyone. <laughs> people that haven't been reading everything uh, may may not know that this class was supposed to be class ten and it's class nine because the people that were supposed to be here are were senior organizers that are so senior they're both ill, and that um, we're, we need to send good thoughts to Kamai Marsharia, who's a comrade here in South Carolina that's not doing well at all, and that so next class we're going to do the theory an analysis class that's just absolutely critical and um, our good friend and ally and homeboy from Bethune, South Carolina, used to be a lawyer, the only lawyer that anyone ever knows that actually had to go to the Supreme Court to not be a lawyer. You can't like quit being a lawyer apparently. Lewis is the first person that quit being a lawyer <laughs> because they said, well you can retire. He said, I don't want to retire. I don't want to be a lawyer. Well you're a lawyer. You went to law school, you practice law. So they actually in the Supreme Court of North Carolina where it was, had to have a ruling that allowed Lewis to quit being a lawyer. And so Lewis Pitts, who's been our lawyer and my lawyer for many years, homeboy from South Carolina, is going to come in and help talk about the, the, the way that corporations have become people in America. Really important class next, next Monday. And then we're going to have a discussion on the practicum. What are you going to do now? And then we're going to have a graduation right here in Columbia. They're all welcome to come. It'll be also on Zoom. And so I, I really, I, I so miss being able to hang out after class, meet people and know what you're doing. And I have intended to like call each one of you and I'll try and reach out individually and personally. But thank you so much. And uh, Daniel, cue the music and y'all take a break. Who's here when we take, um, but Becky? Yeah, I, I'm sorry if somebody mentioned this already and I missed it, but if you did not read Dr. Green's critical race theories, piece that came in the day before yesterday in Jacobin. Mm -hmm. sent out a link in the last email and it's fantastic. And we're thinking about doing some organizing work around that. So if you haven't read that, please. Do. Yeah, and Becky, thank you. This, this critical race theory, when you talk about preparing yourself to take advantage for opportunities, Majeska's mother and W.E. Du Bois in 1905 started preparing us to take advantage of this opportunity to talk about the criticality of race in South Carolina politics. And the fact that Tim Scott went to minimally, edu a minimally 
adequate education in South Carolina, did not learn his history, shall not stop us. And Dr. Green has agreed, we're going to do a town hall on critical race theory within the next two weeks. And we're going to invite Tim Scott to participate. All right. and, but we're going to work with the South Carolina Education Association, and there are several thousands of teachers, and you know, red for, red for Ed, and <laughs> invite the teachers to come to learn what it is that they need to know that's trying to be blocked. I actually had, and I, I don't guess I showed it, I have a, um, a, a screenshot of the law that is in the House of Representatives in South Carolina that is captioned, prohibition of critical race theory get out and so, so they actually this is just like it's happening all over the white folks they got their panties in a wad that that want to continue to control things and they know like lindsey graham does ain't enough angry white men to continue you know to retain control so they want to cut off our ability to vote and make us more stupid and so they want <laughs> that's their plan for the future we have a different plan so stay tuned daniel cue up the music and if y'all want to stay and talk Comments, criticisms, welcome. Stay after the music.